as you take your seats, if you just hold your arms out, just a posture of prayer. I'm learning in my own time with the Lord that just having a posture of prayer kind of helps me to connect with God in a different way. And so if you just hold your arms out, let's pray. Father God, we we come to you tonight, Lord, just grateful, grateful for your abundant love, for your mercy, Lord, for your forgiveness and your grace. Father, I, I'm pretty positive that most of the people in this room, that the desire of their heart is to love you. God, their desire of their heart is to love people, to grow in their faith. God, to obey you, because your word says, if you love me, you'll obey me. And then also to influence others, so that the people around us may know you. Father, we can't do this on our own. God, we can't love you. We can't love others. We can't grow in our faith. We can't obey you. We can't be an influencer without you. So Lord, we open our arms to you tonight, just asking that your Holy Spirit would come and ignite our hearts. God, that your Holy Spirit would refuel us tonight so that we can love you more, so that we can love people more. Father, so that we can obey you and influence others and grow in our faith that the world may know who you are. So come, Holy Spirit. Come, fill our hearts tonight. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, it is so good to see you here tonight at the table. I want to welcome you. Um, if we haven't had a chance to meet, my name is Rick, and, and I am one of the pastors here. And uh, I'm just, uh, every Wednesday night I say this, but I look forward to our time together. I look forward to us gathering together and growing together so that we can go out there and make an impact in the world together. And, uh, and tonight, as we prepare to hear God's Word, uh, we find ourselves in week four of our Lenten series called Give It Up. Everybody say, Give It Up. Give it up. Yeah, so we've been spending a, a, a few weeks uh, in Lent and Lent is that season leading up to Easter. It's a time of preparation. And we've been spending the past few weeks talking about the things in our lives that we should consider giving up, not just for 40 days of Lent, but things in our lives that we should consider giving up for the rest of our lives. And these things that we've been looking at over the past few weeks, these are the things that kind of have a tendency to clutter up our hearts. And, and if, we, if, we, if we were to get rid of these things, we would make more room for Jesus in our lives. And so, for example, the first week, Chris helped us understand uh, the implications of giving up control. And he helped us to understand the, the value of giving up control in our lives. And then we talked about those unrealistic expectations that we have, especially our unrealistic expectations when it comes to God and giving those up. And then last week, Pastor Vicki helped us to understand uh, what it means to give up superiority. Or better yet, how to give up this idea or this feeling that we are better than others. And tonight, tonight I would like for us to consider giving up our enemies. Now, to get us thinking about this, I thought that we might take a look at some famous enemies. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a picture of a person on the screen, and then I want you to uh, have conversation with me and tell me who you think their enemy is. So let's look at the first one right here. So who, who's Bugs Bunny's enemy? Elmer Fudd, exactly. So give Suzanne a big hand, Elmer Fudd. And, uh, they, okay, you got one hand, I'm sorry. Uh, so let's look at the next one here. Ah, Ariel. Ursula. So we have a few more Disney fans in here. Very good, very good. Let's see what the next one is. Oh. 
Darth Vader, absolutely. So there you go. Uh, look at another one there. The Joker is the, the best enemy of Batman. That's right. So the Joker. And uh, let's see what else we got. Syndrome. Who said that? Who said that? Someone up there. There you go. Logan got it. Is that right? Syndrome. Yeah. All right. And then here we go. Last one. Last one. Ooh. Ooh. I thought about that this week. I thought about who are, who are my enemies? Who are the people in my life, my enemies? And I thought about that, and I thought, well, the first person that came to my mind is the kid in seventh grade that punched me and broke my brand new calculator watch. He was definitely my enemy. And then I thought about my girlfriend in uh, 10th grade that cheated on me with my friend. She was my enemy. And then I thought about uh, the 15 or so kids that jumped me in the student parking lot at Rickards High School in Tallahassee in the 11th grade. And I thought all of them were my enemies at that time. And then I, I even began to think a little more serious, and I thought about the man that took my dad's life when I was 17. And I thought he was definitely one of my enemies. And these are just a few of the people in my life that I would call my enemies. And I'm not the only one, though, that, who has enemies, right? Like, I'm pretty positive that you have enemies, too. And we've all got enemies, and some of us probably have more enemies than others. But the truth is this. The truth is that no one can bear, can be our enemy, unless we label them our enemy, right? Right? That no one can be our enemy unless we give them the label of being our enemy. And these days, it seems like anyone can be our enemy, including anyone who disagrees with us politically or religiously or a person who even disagrees with our last Facebook post. Anyone can seem to be our enemy. And yet tonight, tonight we're going to see that Jesus commands his followers to love our enemies, and that to have this love for our enemies that overcomes our differences, whether they be differences differences of opinions or differences of political views or anything else. And so if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to open them up with me to Matthew, the book of Matthew. So the first book in the New Testament, and uh, and we're going to look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 48 together. And our passage tonight is right smack dab in the middle of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus is preaching on real life issues that deal with real human relationships. And so the topics that Jesus is covering in the Sermon on the Mount are issues that we have with other people. They're like one-on-one relationship kind of issues. And so let's read it together and see what he has to say. Starting in verse 38 of chapter 5. It says, you have heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. If you are sued in court and your shirt is taken from you, give your coat too. If a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile, carry it two miles. Give it to those who ask and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. So put your finger right there for a minute because I want us to, let's unpack this. You see, so we've got this law, this law that was in existence that stated an eye for an eye. In other words, what this law was saying is that the punishment must match the crime. That if you lose an eye, then you should take an eye. And, and so it was saying that, but Jesus says to that, says, no, that's the old way of doing things. If someone, he says, slaps you on the right cheek, which back in this time was a form of insult, so if someone slapped you with their left hand on your right cheek, that was an insult, and Jesus says, if someone slaps you on the right cheek, then I want you to turn the other cheek. And then he goes on and says, and if someone sues you for your shirt, I don't want you to just to give them your shirt. I want you to give them your jacket as well. And likewise, if a soldier comes up to you and demands that you carry his stuff one mile, 
I want you to go ahead and carry it two miles. And essentially, Jesus is not forbidding us, or Jesus is not only forbidding us to retaliate, but also commands that our responses should be one of overflowing with graciousness. That as we respond, we should not retaliate, but instead we should respond with this overflowing, overabundance of love. But let's keep reading. Verse 43. Jesus goes on and says, You have heard the law that says, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And that way you will be acting as true, true children of your Father in heaven. For He gives His sunlight to both the evil and the good. And He sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are, a con if you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now as I, re I read that, you might be thinking Jesus has all but lost it here. Because the law tells us to love our neighbor. But Jesus says that we shouldn't stop there. That we should also love our enemies. And not only love them, but pray for them. He's like, you used to live by the whole an eye for an eye law, but I am telling you that you are no longer supposed to seek revenge, but rather you are to respond in love. And it used to be, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But now I am telling you to live a new way. To love your neighbor and to pray for those who give you a hard time. In other words... Jesus is saying, I want you to live an entirely different way. And the primary goal is not about getting even, but rather the goal is to make sure that you reflect the glory of God and the love of God in this broken and messed up world. And I want to say that again because I think that's really important. That Jesus is really saying that the goal for us to love our enemies is to make sure that we reflect the glory and the love of God in this broken and messed up world. Now this is a radical way of living. And you find this under the title of easier said than done, right? And so you might even think this is impossible. You might even be asking yourself, how in the world... Do I love my enemies? Like when I was talking about my enemies, you're thinking about your enemies and you're like, how in the world am I supposed to love that person? Or how in the world am I supposed to show genuine love for that person? Well, let's look again. The first thing that Jesus tells us to do is to not react or retaliate. And let me tell you, the kid that broke my calculator watch in seventh grade, let me tell you, I wanted to retaliate. I wanted to. I'd just gotten my brand new calculator watch. I wanted to punch them in the throat. And then when those kids jumped me in the parking lot, I wanted revenge. I really did. I wanted revenge. And when that man took my dad's life, I wanted an eye for an eye. But here's what happens. Here's what happens when we react to evil with evil. It produces more evil, right? And it only perpetuates and escalates hatred and systems of violence in our world when we respond with evil. And the truth is this, that we will never, ever, ever experience peace in our hearts or in our world if we don't learn to turn the other cheek and love our enemies. Jesus also said not only should we not retaliate, but he said that we should pray. We should pray for our enemies. Now, if you're anything like me, you're like, all right, Jesus, I'll pray for them. I'll pray that they walk in front of a moving bus right now. You know, that, that, that's what we say. Or, or that they'll get what's coming to them. Sure, I'll pray for them. But is that really what Jesus meant when he said and called us to pray for them? I'm pretty confident that Jesus would want us to pray for their good rather than for 
for their demise. I'm pretty confident that Jesus would rather us pray for God's unconditional love to surround them than for a moving bus to come and take them out. I'm just confident in that. You see, Jesus is asking us to do no more or no less than what he did while he prayed for those that were crucifying him when he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I've told you this before, but this is what my mom modeled for me in my life. She tells the story of how on the evening that her husband was killed that she went into the church. We lived right next door to the church, and she went into the church, and she got on her knees, and she prayed for the man that shot and killed her husband. And she didn't pray that, that he would get what was coming to him. She didn't pray that he would be punished. She didn't even pray that he would change. She simply prayed for forgiveness. And so we pray, and we're to pray for our enemies. And if we don't think we can do that, then we ask Jesus to help us to pray for our enemies. But why does Jesus ask this of us? Why should we give up our enemies? Well, I can think of a few good reasons for why we should love our enemies. The first reason is really obvious. We should love our enemies because, well, Jesus told us to, right? Because Jesus said so. And if we're going to follow Jesus, we're supposed to give up our enemies. But I don't think that's the only reason that we should love our enemies. I also think that we should love our enemies because hating them only destroys us. That when we hold hatred in our hearts, the person that that affects the most is us. Hatred destroys us. Someone once said that holding on to hatred is like drinking poison ourselves and expecting the other person to die. That's what hatred does. And here's the truth. Hating your enemies will only destroy you. Not only does it affect you spiritually, but it eats away at you physically and emotionally as well. It affects every bit of who we are. So who of us here is thinking straight when we get angry? Like, how often do we make good decisions in the midst of our anger? How often do we, uh, do we say something stupid or something that we'll regret or something that will hurt others in our anger? Because hatred is a poison in our souls. So we've got to remember that we should love our enemies because hating them only destroys us. And we should also love our enemies because if we don't, we're missing out on the full measure of God's love. When we hold bitterness and anger towards our enemies... We are only crippling our own spiritual lives. You see, when we refuse to give up our enemies, we are sinning and we block out God's love for us. And I don't know about you, but I want to daily experience the full measure of God's love for me. And when I'm holding my, on to my enemies, I miss out on the fullness of God's love. Another reason that Jesus tells us to love our enemies is because Jesus knew that hatred breeds hatred. That hatred breeds hatred. We cannot bring peace into this world if we are busy breeding hatred. I also believe that Jesus said that we should love our enemies because Jesus knew that loving our enemies would transform our lives. That when we choose to love our enemies that our lives are the lives that become transformed, renewed, a new life. Every single one of us in this room were created in the image of God. And every single one of us in this room was created to love God and to love people. And so when we love our enemies, we rise to the level of love that seeks to defeat evil in this world. When we choose to love our enemies... We rise above the rest of the world and we choose to live a life where, where love defeats evil. And check this out. As we are being transformed by, our lo by loving our enemies, oftentimes our enemies' lives are transformed too. Because you know what your enemies expect of us? 
You know what that little kid did on the bus when he punched me? He expected me to retaliate. Same thing when I was jumped by all those guys in, at Rickards High School. They expected me to retaliate. The community that was watching my family after my dad's death, they expected us to retaliate. But when we choose to love our enemies, not only do we transform our lives, but we begin to transform their lives. Because we don't respond in the way that they expect us to. Let's face it. We need to live in a world where the unexpected happens. Abraham Lincoln once said, the best way to destroy an enemy is to make a friend. The best way to destroy an enemy is to make a friend. And finally, we should love our enemies because it is the only kind of love that will transform the world. And let's face it, church. Our world needs transformed. So we talk a lot about violence today. And we wonder if there will ever be peace here on earth. And we want peace, but the only way we get peace is by loving our enemies. The only way the world is transformed is by loving our enemies. This is truly where the rubber meets the road in our personal relationship. The only way that we can do that is one person at a time. And loving the enemies in our own lives. Do you have enemies in your life right now? Enemies in your life, and because you have them, you're missing out on the fullness of God's love? Or are you holding on to enemies, and because of that, you're poisoning your own spiritual life? Or maybe you're holding on to enemies, and because you won't let them go, you're stunting your own spiritual growth? Maybe tonight, the time and the place to give them up. Maybe it's time to rise up to the challenge and to give up your enemies by loving them and by praying for them and praying that they will be surrounded by God's love. You will never experience peace until we follow Jesus' command to give up our enemies. You know what Jesus said? He said, if you love me, obey me. I know it's a radical thinking, but isn't that who Jesus is? Radical. Let's pray. God, thanks so much for the challenge tonight to love our enemies. God, for many of us, it's something that we kind of like put off we read it and we're like, yeah, I know God said that, but I don't want to, I don't want to, I can't do that. Father, I pray that tonight that we would truly rise to the challenge of letting go of our enemies, loving them, praying for them, showing your love to them. God, give us that courage to live our lives the way that you lived your life. Lord, if there's someone in this room tonight that has never said yes to you, Father, maybe you're their enemy right now. But maybe tonight they would lay it down before you and receive you into their lives. Start the greatest relationship that was ever possible.